Today's teardown, another very popular request, a Toyota 4-liter 1GR FE. This is out of a 2007 Toyota 4Runner with 186,000 miles on it, which I must admit is quite premature for one of these engines to fail. This particular engine is out of a parts vehicle I bought at the auction with some water or flood damage. They don't really specify. There's no water line drawn on it. The interior was nice and clean. So I bought it. It had nice off-road accessories, big bumpers, a lift kit, had a ladder, some cool stuff I know I could sell. And we had it towed in. Uh, there's no water damage on the interior. It looked nice. So I figured maybe we could get it started. Well, uh, my guys took the starter apart, cleaned the contacts, put it back together. And well, it, it started and it made a slight, a very slight ticking sound. Okay, so maybe slight isn't the appropriate word and tick is for sure not the appropriate word, but this engine is absolutely bad. I don't know exactly how it's bad, but it, it's, it's bad. So yes, these engines do fail. Toyota's 1GR FE is a four liter dual overhead cam, all aluminum V6 that makes 236 horsepower. I know the later ones had some revisions. They make quite a bit more. These came out in 2003 in the Toyota 4Runner. They were also offered in the FJ Cruiser, the base model Tundra, and of course, the Toyota Tacoma. Now they still use a version of this engine today. It's a very long production run, and I don't know if they're gonna ever, I don't know if they're gonna change because Everyone likes these. I, I haven't met a person that doesn't like these, but there is one thing I can't quite understand about the 1GR, and, and I'd love for you all to help me out here. If these are so good, if everyone loves them, no one can say anything bad about them, why are used engines $3,000 or more? In my experience, when engines are very reliable and very widely available, they're cheap. I mean, look at how 5.3s were before everybody started swapping them. Those engines were four or $500 for nice examples. Are people swapping these into other vehicles? Where is the demand? I gotta know. Well, you guys know the drill. Let's see what the plugs look like. One of the things I do like about these engines is that you can actually change all six spark plugs without removing the intake manifold. Not a lot of V6s are like that. We just gotta pull some brackets out of the way. So these don't look too bad. They're all the same plug, good plugs, densos. They don't have excessive gap, nothing's bent, nothing's broken. They don't look great but they all match, which is a pretty good sign. One thing I'd like to mention, there were 102 degrees outside today. It was a very dense temperature population. I guess what I'm trying to say is, it's still very, very hot in my shop. So if you hear background noise, if you hear fans running, it, it might get a little distracting and I'm sorry, but it is a necessity. Now, the next thing I'd like to do is turn this engine over. We know it runs. I, I know it runs, it made some pretty bad noises, and obviously my guys were able to get all the torque converter bolts out. So that, it's not locked up by any stretch, but I'd like to see if we can feel the noise or something like that. Well, without plugs in it, it should have no load on it. So if there were a bearing problem, you would be able to hear it by moving the crank back and forth. We've seen so many engines on this channel with broad bearing problems that would relate to a knock if the engine were running. And this thing was obviously making a knocking sound and it turns over smooth. There's no tight spots, so I don't... Okay, this is going to be one of those things where we have to wait to get it all the way apart. Yep. The next thing I'd like to do is spend a moment and remove the intake manifold, the throttle body and strip this harness. Now, my guys don't cut harnesses, especially not for Toyotas and 4Runners. We sell every single one. I, I think these harnesses are pretty uh, tasty for the rodent population. So, it's going to be a few... Well, hopefully, I can get this done pretty quickly so we can get this apart, so we can get this engine torn down.
believe that's everything. Now I could try to show you guys what this looks like under here, but I'm gonna wait until we get this lower manifold off, which is uh, I guess what I'm going to do next. I'm gonna continue getting this harness loose so we can get it out of the way. All right, next we'll get this lower plenum, which looks like it's two pieces. I think I can remove it all at once and the rails and ejectors should all come out at one time. Can I get them all? Let's find out. It doesn't appear that I got them all. No, nope, there's one right there. That sounded looser. It's definitely looser. It looks like it has some dowels, which means it's time to wake Blue up. Now we can have a much better look at the intake ports and the intake valves. So that cylinder doesn't look too bad. That one doesn't look too bad either. Oh, there's a little bit of rust. I would say it definitely had some water sitting in here at, at least at least for some period of time. So that one looks good. Okay, that has quite a bit of, of rust pitting on the top of those valves. And quite a bit on the, actually, what is going on back there? It looks like both the intake and exhaust valves are open at the same time. That, that's not how engines work. Um, not these anyway, so that's a problem. Next, I'll remove the left hand valve cover. Yeah, now we're gonna need blue for that one too. This will be the first look inside the condition of this actual engine here. Oh, uh, well, I, I uh-huh, yep, yep, that's a problem. So this looks like it's got a, a bit of varnish in here, but it's not really, it's not really awful. I don't see anything broken, but, if you remember, we looked down the intake port of one of these cylinders, it was this rear cylinder, and it looked like one of the exhaust valves was open along with the intake. So we can see that the lobes are currently pressing down the lifters, but this lifter is depressed by n n nothing? So that, that's, that's a problem. Now is that the problem, or is it one of the problems? Unfortunately, I don't have a really good way of, of trying to tap on that to, to free it up, but I can already tell you that's going to cause a, a little bit of a misfire. Just, just a little. Now for the right hand bank. So this side looks pretty good. I don't see any large gaps between cam lobes and lifters. So that's always a good sign. Next, I'm gonna take a minute and remove the exhaust manifolds. Can I have that back? Give it to me. Give me my... Well, looking in the exhaust port on that cylinder, you can definitely tell that valve is open. That one is not. But I don't see anything bent. It's kind of hard to tell too. The next thing I'm going to do is something you guys have been yelling at me to do for, well, as long as I've been doing teardowns, and that is to drain the coolant by removing the pet cock, or at least loosening the pet cock halfway down the block, which is usually the lowest point of where coolant reaches. So let's see how much coolant is left in here. Well, that, that is a lot easier. I, you guys were right. All right, well, I'm gonna let that run for a bit and we'll uh, start on the, on the front cover. First, let's remove some of these pulleys. I think that one can stay on the bracket. Now I'm going to remove this thermostat housing. Ta-da! 
Come on now. It's O-ringed to the pipe that goes through the valley. Sometimes that can be a little... Ah, that wasn't too bad. Next, we'll get this crank pulley off. I don't think these are pressed on. Nope. Easy peasy. And now, the water pump. So, so uh, about that petcock, and no, I'm not talking about this, nope. The water pump actually looks pretty good. There's not a lot of play in the bearings. Yeah, that's, that's really not that bad. It would make a good backup if nothing's leaking out of the weep hole. It's a Toyota pump. It's definitely something I'd want to hang on to. We're going to put you somewhere safe, buddy. Just, just hang tight. You're going to be just fine. Now it's about time we start peeling the bolts out of this timing cover, but it looks like I need to remove the cam sensors first to get access. Perfect placement, Toyota. That was unplanned. Now it looks like I've just got a whole bunch of 12 millimeter bolts to take out. Did I miss anything? I don't think I did. Again, I still don't know if I had to take these out or not. We're gonna try to take this off without. I think that'll work. Blue. Okay, it's loose there. Uh, am I seeing this right? I gotta take these solenoids out. These are variable valve timing solenoids. Oh, and they are stuck. Oh, that one moves pretty freely. So normally when there's uh, an oiling issue, you'll find a lot of metal built up on these things. And that, that's pretty much true for most manufacturers and most engines. I don't see any metal on that at all. There we are. So yeah, these all look pretty good. All right, now that those are out of the way, Hopefully it comes off pretty easy. I hope. Okay. Or not. Ah, there we go. Something is holding this up. There we go. I think we made it past all that. And there we go. That has the oil pump built in. Everything looks to be in pretty good shape. Well, the timing system actually looks pretty good. I don't see anything, anything too wrong here. Uh, there's definitely some, some sealant here. So I don't know if that's original. I'm inclined to believe that someone has been in here, but maybe Toyota just puts it on everything. It definitely looks like there might be two different kinds of sealant because I see gray here, which looks like Toyota. And it's also looks, it also looks like someone's hit this with a whiz wheel. D don't, don't do that. That's, that's, that, no, there's better ways. But all the timing system components look good. One tensioner is all very simple. What we're gonna do is take a look 
in the oil pan. Ugh. There's some sub-desirable material in there. We'll get to that later. Ooh, that was violent. I was not prepared for that. Not at all. That guide looks okay. The pla this plastic or phenolic material, whatever this is, is still pretty pliable. And it's dated from 07, so it's an original component. It's still good. Now we need to get this side out. I think this just slides off. Yeah, these little, these little dudes just slide right off. It's pretty awesome. Those two, perfect shape. Can I get the chain off? Oh yeah. Oh, watch out. Look at that nice long chain. Man, what a chain. And this one last rail. So that too has the correct date code for being an original component. Look how flexible that still is. If this was a BMW guide, if it was over five, five seconds old, there's no way you could do this. What is the difference? I've never had, this is a 2007. Maybe this was built in 2006. And look at that. That is, that's impressive. This is what guides should be made out of. The next thing I need to do before I go any further is remove the dipstick tube. It's been a while since I've had a good dipstick tube fight. The last thing I want to do is have a tubular confrontation. So is this going to be easy on me? Yeah, that, was, that wasn't bad at all. Thanks, Toyota. Now it's time we start cramming some caps loose to get these cams out. Whoa, that's tight. Now I do realize that there still is a chain on here and there's some tension still on this. We'll just deal with that when we get there. It's for the tensioner. Now probably the smart thing would have been to take this cam gear off. Or maybe I did the right thing. Did I do the right thing? Ah, yes, that wasn't bad. Another interesting design feature of these engines is that this front bearing, this is actually a bearing and not just a journal. So if this gets trashed, you can replace that bearing. The rest of these though, if those get trashed, not so much. But I don't see a ton of damage. A little bit of wear, but nothing awful. I don't see any metal shavings. No forbidden glitter here. The camshafts also look pretty good. A little bit of wear at the tip of the cam lobes. I wonder what causes that, but it's, it's really not terrible. It's just on a couple of those. It's not pitted. And the cam caps all look pretty good, but these, these have a little bit of wear there. Now for the left hand bank. Man, that second one. <laughs> it's a lot of force for a cam cap.
So this side does not have a replaceable bearing, and that is because if you go back to the right bank, this covers the head bolt. So we're gonna have to remove this bearing to get access to that head bolt. But the design of this cylinder head does not have that same problem. So there is no replaceable bearing on this head. This all looks pretty good. And then of course, you can see a problem here. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm gonna get my, my drift. And I'm gonna give this a couple taps and see if I can free that up, close that valve, but I, I, I doubt it. I'm gonna go with a uh, no. Now the journals don't look too bad on this head either. There's a little bit of wear, but it's, it's not really that bad. These camshafts are in about similar condition. Nothing major. Rear cam caps do have some some wear, but we've definitely seen worse on this channel. Before we go cracking head bolts loose, I need to get this coolant crossover out of the way. Now this too is o-ringed in. Sometimes it protests a little bit. And by a little bit, I mean every time. It's a very, very, very strong o-ring. But I think I can pull that out with the pipe maybe. Oh, I see. We can do this. Oh, I thought for sure that would do it. And uh, yes, I know it looks like I'm, I'm prying against the mating surface, but I'm actually prying against the gaskets, which are protecting the mating surface. Just let go. Stubborn is a word I would use wholeheartedly. You know what? That can kind of hang out there until I get the heads off. It's not a problem. That's just gonna, that's gonna have to suffice. The next thing on the agenda is to tap out this, this cam bearing. Now it's time to get the head bolts out. I don't know how tight these are going to be. Not too tight. Now the head should hopefully lift right off. Oh yeah. Well that that's a whole bunch of boogery RTV that I don't think Toyota put there. I don't think Toyota uses this black. That's that's not uh that's not Toyota style. That's my experience anyway. Head gasket looks good. Mmm, okay. Well, we need to do our test. So far, so good. I, uh, I guess we could turn it over. Actually, before we turn it over, I'm gonna wait until we get the other head off. But let's go look at the head that just came off this engine. This cylinder head looks pretty good. I don't see any damage. I don't see any cracks. It's a good usable cylinder head. So from what I can see, the bores look pretty good. A little bit of staining. It's not terrible though. Before we get the big head bolts out, we have two of these to get out. Ha! Let me get let me get something stronger. Wow, those are, those are actually very tight. I need something with more beef. Oh, 
Oh, okay. Okay, here comes this head. There's some problems here, but first, our test. Wait, wait. That's not, something's, something's up here. Oh, uh, that's broken. That's really, yeah, that's, that's totally broken. So first we're gonna start out looking at the cylinder head. That combustion chamber looks okay. That one's definitely had some moisture run through it. And, and, and then there's this one, which has um, problems, lots of problems. It looks like the piston has obviously struck the head. That valve is open. We knew that. We knew that was a problem. Like I said, it didn't mean it was the only problem. It was just a problem. Let, let's go look at, at the short block. So this cylinder doesn't look too bad. This one isn't too bad. This one's bad, uh, really bad. It has uh, new valve reliefs that were presently not there before, especially on the intake side. So I bet you all of those valves are bent. And, and we know that the, the rod is, is no longer a connecting rod, but it's a disconnecting rod. And we can definitely tell there was some moisture sitting in here because there's a ridge of rust along the top. So that, that, that's all bad, but we're, we're not done yet because we still need to see how it looks when it turns over. Actually, this is, this is gonna just be a problem for me. I got, looks like one 10 millimeter bolt that I couldn't see before. We're just gonna get this out of the way and be done with it. Good riddance. So first, we're gonna look at the right bank. All right, that reaches the top of the bore. That reaches the top of the bore. And that reaches the top of the bore. A perfect score. Now for the left bank. All right, that reaches the top of the bore. That does too, but this one seems to be just hanging out in, in place. Yeah, see, this is a, it's just a, it, it just cylinder deactivation, the cleanest way. We're gonna make sure we get all the oil out of this thing before we turn it all the way over. Yeah, that's oil. There wasn't really too much in there. Now it's time to turn this engine all the way over. So about that petcock letting all, uh-oh, I heard some loose stuff in here. Yeah, it's gonna be fine. All right, time to get the lower pan off. Now we're gonna gently remove this pan. Gently remove this pan. I don't know what that was, but it, it fell out. That sounded good. Oh, that is some kind of ketchup and chocolate marmalade that I've never seen. Doesn't quite smell like it though. stay there. Well, at first glance, you can definitely see there's some debris on the pickup. Ooh, that's RTV. That doesn't go there. One set part of the engine you do not want to seal up is the pickup. In fact, this is all RTV. But I don't know if that's enough to clog it. 
and then the oil pan or the lower pan I don't know if the color really shows up that well but it's kind of a coffee chocolate mix but I don't see any chunks of metal next I'm going to pull the upper oil pan Well, I don't know that I would call that oil. Whatever this is, probably isn't the best lubricant. Just going out on a limb. And a look inside this thing. It's not super duper clean. It's not terrible. It's just not great. Now, the real problem is actually uh, this right here because you can. Actually, you can't. That's that's just stuck on there. But if you look, um, it, it's bent a little and broken. And then there's a, uh, there's a bunch of parts hanging out in there. It's not a good place to keep them. It's my personal opinion. Now we're going to start pulling the rods and pistons out. Does this move at all? No. So we're still going to get those cracked loose, but we'll probably have to deal with that once the crank is out. Uh oh, I see. You can also see there's an impact mark on the block here. I don't know if we're going to be able to get this rod cap off. We're going to give it a, a gentle tap. See what we can do. Well, it's splitting. Well, I think that answers a couple questions. See if old blue can help us out here. What if Yes. It worked. Oh, that's 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 bad. Looks like that stud is gonna it's gonna be a problem. I might have to take the stud out because that arm is in the way. I guess I could take this out of the way, but I'd rather just get an external torx on that stud and yank it. There now when I pull the crank, this plate can come with it. Actually we'll pull we'll pull both studs. Just to be symmetrical here. Now it's time to start on the main caps. Okay, let's see if my plan will work with this plate. Perfect. There's only one matter of business left and that is the other half of that broken rod and piston. Well, let's start off with the rod bearings. 
not good. This thing definitely has had some debris run through here, or maybe it was starved with oil. But not every bearing is bad. Some are definitely worse than others. And this is the bearing out of the bad rod. But I don't think that's enough. This really isn't enough to cause a broken rod. Sure, it's, it's not good, but that is not enough. Let's check to see if these are original Toyota. They are, in fact, Toyota bearings. So I don't think this, is, this has been a part before. So the rods and pistons, it's really kind of stiff wrist pins. Not every cylinder is that bad, but on many of these, not this one so much, but some of these others, the top compression ring is pretty, pretty gummed up. Like this one, there we go. I, got it, I just got it freed up. That one's decent. That one's decent. And then you get to that piston got in a fight with its neighbor. Wrist pin's really stiff. Top compression ring is, is collapsed into part of the ring land. Well, actually not. It, it's free. It just looked like it. And then you get to this this rod. Actually, we can empty out this, this pile of molasses-like substance was inside of that piston. So there's, there's chunks of piston here. I think this piece and this piece belong to that guy. Either way, this piston is actually in reasonable condition considering this thing definitely has some water in it. That rod, it's, uh, it's broken. Now the crankshaft, all the journals look pretty decent. Okay, let's give them a little bath real quick. There's a little bit of wear. Might polish out. I don't know if the crankshafts on these are, are really that valuable. I don't really see a ton of damage from the event. There's definitely some marks and nicks, but I don't think those are going to cause any problems. But one of the things I do like to look for, usually, not always, but on, on some engines, when they compress water and a rod bends, the distance between the journal and the top of the or bottom of the piston is, is decreased. And some engines have a very tight tolerance. And when that happens, you'll see wear or marks or gouges or damage to the very edges of the balance the counterbalance part of the crankshaft and that'll indicate that that rod was shorter shortly before it broke but I don't see that on this engine so I'm guessing that that is likely not possible here and the rod broke before that happened. The main bearings all look pretty good. A little bit of wear on those two. Nothing to write home about. Now the block. One big impact. I think that's just one impact there a little gouge at the bottom of that bore and, and that's pretty much it let me let me get this cleaned off and we'll see if we can find any more damage so after cleaning it it did reveal a little bit more damage it's still not that terrible i think we would see much more damage if that piston had come apart now that the pistons are out we can get a better look at the bores and they don't look too bad this one is pretty rough at the top. That would definitely need some repair work. But there's no damage from this incident except for at the very bottom. And it's actually more so on the adjacent cylinder. And you can't really even see it from this angle. I hemmed and hawed over whether I was going to take the oil pump apart because then I had to reassemble it to sell the timing cover. But after seeing the condition of the bearings and the other slight issues with this, I, I feel it's most prudent to take this apart because if there's damage in here, it could render this cover useless. So let's get this torn down.
Well, it's definitely got some oil in there. It's usually what you find inside of an oil pump. It does feel kind of gritty. I'm gonna have to clean all this up so we can actually look at the condition of this. Well, the outer housing, or should I say the inner housing, definitely has some wear. The oil pump drive gears wear. It's not the worst we've seen, but it's certainly not perfect. And the actual cover itself, some damage. There's definitely been some debris run through here. It's been quite some time since we've seen an engine that sucked in water on this channel, but the hydraulic properties of water are still the same. You can't compress it. It's not going to work. You're going to have engine problems. It is not worth trying to drive through standing water unless it's a life or death scenario. The only thing waiting for you on the other side is not dry land. It's a hefty repair bill or worse, losing your rig. Now, in this case, this forerunner was lifted. It had big tires, off-road bumpers, no snorkel. Might have saved him in this situation. We don't know. We don't know the situation. But either way, this person drove through standing water or water got in the intake somehow. And I would bet they thought they could make it and it got a little deeper than they planned on. I will say there was no water intrusion on the interior. The seat track still worked. The power windows worked. Everything worked on the inside. It didn't smell bad. So I don't think any water got on the inside, but it definitely got on the inside of that engine. Now, I know some of you are asking this question, and that is, would I have bought this if I knew the engine was blown up? Because sometimes flood vehicles usually aren't driven into floods. They're flooded when they're parked, and a lot of times the drivetrain survived. But the answer is this went for stupid cheap. I, I don't know how I got it so cheap. I sold the frame and the aftermarket front bumper for more than I paid for the truck with towing and fees. So it was a huge win and I still have a lot of parts to sell from it. I have body panels, I have electronics, I have a, a uh, rear end, I have a transmission and a lift kit. So if you'd like to buy any of those parts or any of the parts off of the engine from this, or if you want to buy parts off of this 2001 4Runner rare purple truck, it's kind of a shame to see it like this. I'm going to leave our email in the video description. You can also go to importapart.com and peruse our inventory. I've been uploading our parts cars just about every single week. I really hope you enjoyed this teardown. As always, I love all the comments, all the feedback, even the criticism. I love it all, and I'll catch you on the next one.